Welcome or welcome back new viewers and game bears. It's time for another video on unused content and today we're looking at the unused content of Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, not the Switch remake of the GameCube original version. And well, why don't we just jump right into things. Alright, starting with the early build and the reveal trailer. This game was initially titled Paper Mario 2 and here's what that logo would have- wow. <laughs> here's what that logo would have looked like. It's very similar to the logo from the first game, just you see the massive pink 2 over here. Kind of glad they didn't go with this and they went with a different, you know, font for an art style. But anyways, this game was initially titled Paper Mario 2 and featured a far different logo. One reminiscent of the original Paper Mario's logo. Part of the original trailer shows an extra ledge above the pipe in the room directly east of the Thousand Year Door with a HP Plus badge on it. It can be accessed via moving platform which had a wall over it halfway which appeared to be passable with the help of Vivian. And you can see that right over here, with the heart HP plus badge up here, as well as this block that is there in the final version. Also, Buildum and Marilyn and Dupe was originally going to be fought somewhere in Riverside Station, which I did mention during my playthrough of the Switch remake, and for some reason, again, Nintendo, you have the opportunity right there. You brought back the Prince and Mush fight, which, fun fact, was also originally unused in the original. Why didn't they bring back this Shadow Sirens fight? It makes no sense. But anyways, the trailer also showed that an item shop will be labeled with mushrooms, much like in Super Paper Mario, rather than the fire flowers seen in the final game. Red Bones was initially named Red Koopa Skeleton in this in the same trailer. One can see that Tornado Jump was initially called Hurricane Jump. The status element slow had a different icon, and a snail instead of a sad purple face. The jumping and partner swapping sound effects from the previous games are used here, probably as placeholders. Anyways, you already showed you these two. Here's Hooktail's castle. Notice in the final game, the door is just open from the start. Alright, here's an early version of the beginning of Hooktail's castle, and this door is open from the start, when it's not in the final. Here is an early battle in Hooktail's castle, with Tornado Jump named Hurricane Jump, but notice how Hurricane is spelled different. I use Hurricane on you, it's super effective. <laughs> Alright, and here's an early version of Tech. Really enough with his uncensored look, since he had blue in the, in the, well, in, uh, US versions of the game, when the, what am I call it, the, uh, Japanese versions had red, and then the remake that also had red. And this design for Tech also looks a bit more primitive, if you will, like a little less high-tech. I guess pun intended, screw it. Alright, here's an early version of the Great Tree. The ground has more of the gradient rainbow effect in the final version. So it looked a little more monochromish gray. I'm kind of glad they went with the rainbow touch in the final game. Alright, moving on to the demo disc, which apparently this game had a demo. If anybody somehow has their hands on this demo, please let me know. That would be really cool. Anyways, a demo version released on the GameCube promotional disc includes various scripture, scriptural differences. Though the, the demo only allows for 15 minutes of play at a time, the files inside of the game reveal several early concepts and placeholders. If title is used outside of battle, Gambella will say, I usually would have something witty to say here, but I'm waiting for the final version break of the fourth wall, which would imply the actual titles of areas had not been written yet. The next monster are called Boomer Gangers, oh for fuck's sake. Boomer Gangers, God, I'm glad they changed that. Like, first you had... That one guy from Super Mario RPG named Boomer. Later on, you have a pixel named Boomer, and then this. Really? Anyways. The Red Bones boss is called the Red Koopa Skeleton. We went through that before. The Dull Bones are called Koopa Skeletons. Yeah, imagine if Drab Bones were just straight up called Koopa Skeletons. A little boring of a name, in my opinion, but whatever. In addition to the above, Pale Piranhas were simply called Piranha Plants, and Poison Puffs were called Poison Fogs, which, personally, I think Fog is a better name for those puff enemies. Alright, Petal Metals was called Star Crystal Fields by the menu, and Petal Fields by Gambella. Most likely a placeholder name. Or that could be what Petal Meadows was initially going to be before being changed. Anyways, Glitzville was referred to as a Japanese name, Oolong Town, implying that it had not been localized yet. In addition, Twilight Town is called Spectralia. I kind of prefer that name, though it's a little hard to say. Several times in the script. And completely original name. A completely original name, excuse me. All instances of Roquepoort being used are instead spelled Roquepoort with a Q. That's gotta be a typo. Alright, Hooktail is said to be weak to frogs instead of crickets. Her weakness to frogs were restored in the Switch remake. Yep, that was fixed, since originally it said she was weak to cr crickets. The sound of crickets when it clearly sounded like a frog. 
All right, Goombella's description on the partner menu also mentions Goomelda. Why is this the female Goombas? That sounds like a Zelda reference, which it says right here is a reference to Zelda from the Legend of Zelda series. Nifty is named Toodle in the demo. Bulbulber is named Bulbubo, Bulbulbo. Tosity is named Dainty. Merly is named Sandu. Miss Mouse is named Miss Mouse. Okay, it's basically the same thing, just slightly different. Instead of MS, it's M-I-S-S, so not much of a difference there. It wouldn't have mattered either way. A pungent is named Punto. Our dried bouquet are named dried flowers. Life shrooms are named emergency shrooms. I kind of prefer the name, actually. And courage shells are called courage colas. Probably some Japanese thing there, I don't know. The spin jump is called the ground pound in the demo. Eh, ground pound. I mean, you literally ground pound, so it would make sense for it to be called that, but anyways. Alright, here's what the original title screen was going to look like. Notice how we have Madame Flurry and Koops on here, and not just Gambella and Mario. And this is before the Thousand Year Door title was made, and notice how the background's a yellow color as well. Kind of looks bland to what we get in the final game, so it's nice they like to see how they evolved from that. Alright, here's an early version of the W emblem that's purple, which would initially turn Mario's colors to Waluigi's colors. In the final game, you just have to use the L emblem and the Wario W yellow emblem in order to do that, which I prefer that. Probably saved them from having to make a, you know, implement that into the game and put it in different areas, so they likely took that out just to save time. An early design for the champ's badge in the middle of Chapter 3, only found in the demo. And this is what it would look like. Alright, and finally with the gradients... An early design for the strange stack that you'd get in the Pit of Under Trials, and this was also only found in the demo. Here's what it would look like. And now we move on to unused data. The debug mode, by pressing X, B, R, B, Y, and then L on the title screen, debug mode is enabled, which I have a feeling that's only available through hacking. Does that work at all, Virgins? I should try that out on my GameCube copy. Though, be careful, because it says right here, subsequently pressing Z on the title screen displays the game's build data, and crashes now display a crash report. Yeah, report. This works on all versions. It tells me it works on all versions, so that does scare me a little bit. I mean, apparently if it works on all versions, I should try that, only apparently it'll crash your game. Probably took that out in the Switch remake, but anyways. I honestly, if, it, if you don't mind it, if y'all have a GameCube copy of this game, hey, try it out yourself. Let's see what happens, if you're all right with that. All right, anyways, graphics. Of all the partners from Paper Mario are going to appear, as I stated throughout the playthrough, but we're cut off as well. Lady Bell and Paracarry are the only ones that actually do show up, if you see that in my playthrough, you see it. There is also a strange robot creature and two palette swaps of Screamy, which was one of Luigi's partners that we see throughout the game. Admiral Bomry had a different sprite, which I mentioned throughout the playthrough, which had the design of a sailor, a soldier, I mean, rather than a sailor. Alright, which depicted him wearing army gear, while a early sprite of Vivian depicts her with a shorter body and a flame on the end of her hat. Which, I think I prefer them taking away the flame, because I think the hat is enough of a reference to the fact that she's a fire elemental, and also, she's kind of cursed looking this short, but we'll get to that. Comes up starts her detailing the latter two designs, is included as unlockable extras, switch remake, okay. Additionally, revealing that Beldum and Merlin were respectively going to be have ice and lightning at the end of their own hats. Though no graphics of these are present in the game's data. Yet they finished Vivian first, well then again she is a partner, so it makes sense they prioritize her over her sisters who are unplayable partners. There was also going to be a dark version of the Atomic Boo, which also later ended up going unused in Super Paper Mario, which would have appeared in Poshly Sanctum as a mid-boss, which I think I would have preferred that since Chapter 6 has the least amount of bosses of any chapter. Alright, the Dark Atomic Boo was also went unused Super Mario, I already said that, and it was fully coded in instead of only having graphics. Bone Tails had also looked a little different, which I would mentioned th during the Pit of Hundred Trials episode. Having blue eyes, as she, which she was not mentioned as a she in the, in the uh, original Paper Mario, but that was the thing in the Switch remake, did not have eyes in the final game. Abyss's man, Cheap Cheap, was going to appear with an unknown role. Red variants of the Buzzy Beetles, the Parrot Buzzies, and the Spiky Buzzies were going to appear, but they were removed in exception, ex exception of the pair from Glitz Pit Red Spike Tops. Hyper and Ultra Bomb on variants were also unused. Luigi was also planned to wear the Poltergust 3000 from Luigi's Mansion during his appearance as a member of the audience during battle, but the sprites go unused, and what the hell would he have done with that? <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, here's that unused robot enemy. If you try to hack it into the game, it literally won't have any animations because they never made any animations for it, but it can work in a battle. 
This cut at the beginning of development and therefore do not have any animations made, as I stated, and this is what it'll look like. Kinda looks like one of those old weights you'd see at the gym. Just with arms and legs and a face, or feet and a face. Alright, here's Admiral Bomberry's beta design. Which, honestly, I almost prefer this over his sail de sailor design, but both look really good, so I don't know which one I prefer, honestly. Which one do you prefer? Alright, here's a shorter Vivian with the fire at the end, which, again, I'm glad they took that out, because one short Vivian, she can't hurt you, she doesn't exist, she's right here. And just, I think the hat looks better without the fire. I mean, red is already a decent enough color to show that she's a fire elemental. Alright, dark atomic blue, which I think looks pretty neat. Here it is, go iron at you, trying to scare you. And here it is, all confused. Likely get it being under the confused status effect. Right, here's B Bone Tail's early design with that blue eyeball, which honestly, maybe Bone Tail is a little scarier without it, but part of me kind of prefers her with the eye. Just a little more detail that I kind of wish they put in there, but eh, they didn't have to at the same time. The business cheap cheap called Puku, or C underscore Puku in the coding. Most likely just code name, since it wasn't given a real name later on. Red Buzzy Beetles. The Red Para Buzzy. Red Para Spiky Buzzy. Alright, an Ultra Bomb Bomb. Which, I want to say the Ultra Bomb Bomb and the Hyper Bomb Bomb were most likely going to function similarly to the Hyper Goomba and the Hyper Bog Cleft from the previous game. Well, you know, in this game too. So they can charge up deal more damage to you or something. Alright, and now we get on to one of the more interesting things. The Paper Mario partners, besides Lady Bow and Paracarry, who did make it in the final game. Alright, here's Goombario's unused sprite. Cooper's unused sprite. Bombette's unused sprite. Also, might I say, Cooper has seen some things, man. Look at his eyes. What? The, still the most broken character from the first game. There's her sprite. Sushi. And finally, Spike, I mean Lock Lester, his unused sprite. And again, Another unused opportunity. Ga uh, I almost said Game Freak. Nintendo, you remade this game and you didn't bring back the six other playable characters from the previous game when you had the chance? Man, this doesn't deserve to be called a remix. It's just a freaking remaster at this point. But uh, whatever. Alright, an early design of the Black Smorg. The final Smorg is called C underscore N underscore Mo underscore A. While this early version is called Test Bomb. This is what it would have looked like. I guess it was named Test Bomb as a way to just, you know, test out the Smorg boss fight in Chapter 6, most likely, and I guess they changed the color later on. Alright, here's an early enemy called Screamy, which is in the final game, but only as one of Luigi's partners, which is white and red, after you beat Chapter 6. He's actually called someone named to the name Smorg, so I guess this thing would have been related to the Smorgs in some way. I mean, because of Luigi's partner, it made its way into the game, but not entirely. Alright, here's another coloration for it. And here it is running. Really cartoonish looking running animation. Here's an early unfinished sprite of Spanios, just staring into my soul, goddamn. Uh, here's another unfinished sprite of the hamburger Spania, or Spinia, and its rainbow counterparts right over here. I kind of like this, actually. And it was apparently this rainbow one was going to be an early partner for Luigi, as it says over here. Here appears to be a rainbow Spania. No shit. <laughs> Anyways... And yeah, his rainbow counterparts, Sp Spanio, are called... Not gonna say that in the coding. And here's what it looked like. Real tasty looking Spanio right over there. They probably took it out because people would try to eat it. <laughs> Too bad, something you can't do in game. I bet even if it was in the final game, they wouldn't have tried it. Anyways, a green recolor for the bulbs. They were only found during chapter one. A white recolor, white and yellow recoloring of a bulb. This is what it would have looked like. Very similar to the ones from the first game. And here's one with the pink center. A uh, green recolor of a toad conductor during chapter 6. Which I like that more than the blue one, I'll be honest. And Luigi using the Poltergeist 3000, which I don't know why the hell he's turned in that direction. Probably doing something sus, but whatever. Alright, an unused coconut recipe. Probably would have been using the coconuts from chapter 5. An early version of the rock throne from the audience. I think they changed it because that's clearly not a rock, that's a brick. Those are different. <laughs> Anyways, an early version of a can thrown by the audience. Looks a little more lower quality compared to the one used in the final game. An early star key, most likely the star key used in Chapter 8. Kind of glad they changed that as well. This one looks a little dusty, if you will. An unused key, probably an early version of a castle key because Hooktail's head is on it. Which, actually, I think I kind of prefer this design for the Hooktail keys. 
Either that, or I guess it spoils the boss of that chapter, even though you see them before they... You see Hotel before you even go to the castle, you just don't see her face. So maybe that's why they changed it. An unused item resembling a fire flower with a candy cane-like stick on it. Wonder what that would have been used for. Alright, an early version of the item shop sign. And a pillow, that was probably an early version of the blanket on the Exodus Express. And blankets are better than pillows. I love blankets, anyways. A badge called Supercharge. Most likely would charge your attack by 3 or something instead of 2. Kind of like the unused charge badge in the first game. Alright, early icon for the plane ability. I guess, I have a feeling this would have showed up if you stood on one of the plane panels. That could be what that was. Either that or it would just straight up be on the plane panels. It could also show up in the UI when you stand on one of them. Alright, this is an early one for the paper ability. Alright, the star rod, called C underscore Koopa, which suggests that maybe the star rod was originally going to be used during the Bowser boss fight in Chapter 8. Which is weird, because... Bowser doesn't have the Star Rod anymore. Why would he have the Star Rod again? After what happened in the first game. So, I guess the devs thought that too and decided to make that unused, since it wouldn't make sense for him to have it. Alright, unused green boots. Here's what they would have looked like. Most likely, my guess is these would have been the super boots, before they settled with the blue color. Early jump icon, here it is. And here's the early hammer icon. The early item icon with a fire flower, instead of a mushroom. The early special icon. Early tactics. And finally, unused half star icon. Which I have a feeling would have been used for the star points, maybe. Either that or the crystal star gauge. Something like that. Those are most likely what they were used for. Either that for, for testing purposes. Alright, here's the unused slow icon. Or, yeah. The unused pow down from Mario. Or for Mario. Any, I guess any time your attack power is lower, this would show up. Which is again, kind of glad they changed that. Because man, he is sad. Anyways, unused status effects. An unused pow down status exists in the game's coding. Under the name, parent, uh, not parentheses, quotations, battle underscore common. While hacked into the game, it displays the message attack has dropped. I already showed you what that looked like. Unused glitch spits battle conditions. A total of about 70 different special conditions are coded for battles in the Glitz Pit, but only a very small subset of about 15 are actually used in-game. Many of the unused conditions are split to apply specifically to Mario or his partner. The game scripts have has multiple duplicate strings for some used conditions, suggesting they may have originally been unused ones before or being overwritten. It is unclear how some conditions were expected to function, such as Mario giving having to attack the audience, which is not an action command and can be performed freely in-game. All but one condition has a variable that can be configured, though many of, of the used conditions set this value, value variable to zero. Therefore, it is possible that multiple variants of those conditions were also planned. And I'll read some of them because there's quite a long list, so I'm not reading all of that. Alright, succeed automatically, so most likely just not a condition. Do not jump n amount of times, like say three times, don't jump three times. Do not use jump, jump times, do not use hammer, hammer in time. Yeah, you get the gist. I'll keep it over here for a split second in case anyone wants to pause and read all of these. Alright. I don't have the sound on on this video, well, outside of my mic, of course. But some of the songs here, and like back in the Super Paper Mario one, I don't want to play these just in case I get a copyright strike, so just going to leave that alone. Alright, there are two unused tracks. One sounds like a theme used for an introduction of a character, and the other sounds like a boss fight. This may mean that another character was going to be in the game, but was written out of the final version, like these songs. Alright, this song is somewhat similar to the introductions of a new pixel in Super Paper Mario, and also it sounds like an unused song from Luigi's Mansion. It was apparently supposed to be played at Riverside Station. Really? Does that suggest maybe Duplus would have joined or some weird thing? I don't know. I don't know that suggests we would get another partner in in uh, Chapter 6, just like in Chapter 6 in the first game. But the, I guess the Dev Star 6 slash 7 partners, if you chose to get Miss Mouse, was enough, so they didn't want to do an 8th partner. I kind of agree with that, because having 8 partners in, in the first game was slightly excessive, especially since 3 of those partners you'd get in Chapter 1. Alright, the Switch remake uses a reworked version of this song in the back entrance and underground portions of the Riverside Station. Alright, this theme over here, this song can be heard in the demo version starting screen. The theme is very similar to the start screen in Super Paper Mario. 
Huh, neat. It's always nice. One thing I always like is when they have old concepts. It's not just in games either. They do this in books and in movies and in cartoons as well. Where they'll take old ideas and either repurpose them in remakes or use them in future installments. Which I do in my own little game stuff as well when I'm making my games. Like I did one time in one of the board games I made back when I was in middle school. But that's a discussion for another day. Uh, there's some dialogue, which I'm not going to read all these. I'm only going to read some in each respective character's voice. Presumably, for the sake of completion, uh, completeness, all Mario's partners have in the has in the glitz pit dialogue for when he gets prompted to the Major League there. However, only Yoshi is used, as he was required to beat the Iron Cliffs, and there's no opportunity to change partners in the ensuing cutscenes. So, each of the partners... I guess, you might, my guess is all this dialogue for Goombella, Koops, and Flurry, because these are the partners you have by the time Yoshi joins the team, are used in-game, but because you can't change partners after beating the Iron Cliffs, or the Iron Adonis twins, it's only Yoshi's lines that are used. So, I'm gonna read some of them, but not all of them, because, yeah, that's a hell of a lot of lines. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what? No hellos. These guys are totally freezing us out, Mario. What? What's wrong, Mario? What? Are you saying the champ's belt? You're totally right, Mario. This crystal star is... is a fake! Sheesh, sheesh. Sorry, Mr. Birdie. I didn't mean to say your belt was fake. Take it easy. I think I tweaked him out a bit. <laughs> Alright, enough with Goombella's lines. Here's Coop's lines. Um, judging by the dead silence, I'd say these guys don't like us much. Um, uh, what's up, Mario? Uh, what? Are you serious? The champ belt... Mario, you're right. This crystal star, it's a fake. Um, uh, gee, sorry, man. I didn't mean to insult your fancy belt. They're, whoops, I made him mad. Oh, dear. These fellows don't seem quite as friendly as the minor leaguers. Mario de Island, what is it? Come again. The champ's belt, you say? My stars, it's completely true. This crystal star, it's a fake. Oh, I do apologize, sir. I didn't mean to embarrass you in front of your belt. Oh, dear, I do believe I made that chicken angry. Oh, God, Flurry, calm down. Anyways. Uh, similarly, in Twilight Town, all, five, all, all then five partners have dialogue from when the mayor sends Mario off and wishes him well. Only Vivian is used because at the last opportunity to change partners, Mario had no choice but to use Vivian as this duplice had turned the other against him. Gimbella. All right, Mario, let's go back to Rogueport, okay? Well, Mario, uh, let's go back to Rogueport, huh? Are you quite ready, Mario? Let's go back to Rogueport. Okie dokie, Gonzales. Let's kick it back to Rogueport. All right, that's their unused design, or dialogue. Apparently, at one point, the Pit of Andre Charles was going to have a trap on some floors. The device on the levels are now active. You can no longer change allies during battle. Huh, that would have made the Pit of Andre Charles even more tedious than it already is. I wouldn't say it's that tedious if you have right setups, but first go around, if you don't have much experience with it, in it, it can be a bit tedious. The device on the level is now active. You can no longer use your hammer in battle. The device on this level is now active. You can no longer use your jumps in battle. The device on this level is now active. You can receive double coins after battle. Seems like a bit of a challenge system just to make battles even more challenging. Alright, there's even more dialogue down here, but I'm not going to bother reading all that. Probably just up to what's here. I want to read this part first. At one point, upon defeating the Shadow Queen, saving and restarting, Mario would be, would begin the game by himself and would have manually get his partners back together again. Only Koops, Flurry, and Yoshi have completed dialogue. The latter is saying something about how he registered us from the Glitz Pit again. Vivian has untest untranslated Japanese dialogue. All right, so kind of glad they changed that because in the final game, after the final boss, Mario comes back to Rogueport and all of his partners are just right there, ready to join him again. Here, you would have had to re-recruit them and whatnot, which I'm kind of glad they didn't do. There's an RPG I was thinking of I've played in the past, where once you beat the final game, or the final boss, I mean, you actually do have to re-recruit your partners. I just forgot which game that was. It'll probably come to my mind later. Another dialogue. Inside the game's data, dialogue files are stored to directories. It's appropriate language. Yeah, just storage for dialogue, and yeah, I'll... If you guys want to pause for a second to read all that, here you go, but I'm not going to read all that. Just so this video doesn't go dragging on for too long. And then there's this shit. A lot of unused dialogue for various parts of the game. I'll go through it slowly, just in case anyone wants to read, like, pause and read it. If you want to, this is your choice.
All right, and that's enough with all that unused dialogue. Lastly, unused item and badges. Just like in the first game, there are unused items and badges. Uh, there are unused dialogues for the Fuzzy Horde as well, so... Yeah, skipping a little bit. So let's talk about this first before we talk about that. All right, max HP is 20. Attack or defense is 1. And it's 0. A completely crazy horde of fuzzies that attacks in mass. Basically a swarm of scary blackness. While the fuzzy hordes does have a long description in the remake, it is completely different. So this. Which I thought you could tattle the fuzzy horde in the original, but I guess not. Alright, anyways, items. Trade off, which looks like Bowser's foot, maybe, or some weird bear paw. Whatever. Alright, when used in battle, enemies will give more star points than usual. Sounds like a decent way to grind, actually, but it's called trade off. It doesn't say anything else about it in the description. And item number, I guess, is 0091. I mean, it's called trade-off. So clearly the effect and description was never finished, and I guess was scrapped pretty early on in development. I mean, I don't get... I mean, I'm going to obsess a little bit. It's called trade-off. And it's supposed to give you more star points than usual. But what's the trade-off? Do the enemies deal double the damage? Are our action commands harder to perform? Maybe more enemies will show up to, you know, make up for the fact that you're getting more star points? I don't get it. And the icon doesn't really help much with that either, but here's what it would have looked like. Alright, invalid item has a... looks like a poster of Mario's face on it or something. Maybe an autograph on top of it, too. It appears to be a poster of Mario. The graphic is used as a reference image of Mario by Shadow Sirens in Chapter 2. Ah, so it's basically an early version of the little picture that the Shadow Sirens have at Chapter 2. In the final game, like, Vivian does mention how she has a picture, but there's no you know, item slot for it. There was no icon for it, I guess this would have been the icon. In the final version, they decided to make it unused, and they just mention it, so... Likely did that just to save time. <laughs> Alright, 005A is its item hex, and finally, Koopa Curse! Here's what it would have looked like. Looks like an early version of, like, a poison status effect, if you will. Also looks like the early... It kind of looks like the slow-go badge from the first game as well, so... That's most likely what that was based on. When using Battle Mario, can not give one enemy the slow status. Which, if you don't know what the Slogo badge does, because I never used that badge, actually, in the first my playthrough of the first game, it will make Wario move really slow in the overworld, and that's pretty much it. It's got no use in battle. Here, it seems like it would have been a status effect of some sort, but there's no way to cause it in the final game. Its uh, item hex is also 00B2. And finally, the badges. All or nothing P, our partner, would have used 4BP. Here's what it would have looked like. Just the all or nothing badge, just with, you know, the little partner icon on it. I hit action commands, up attacks, allies attacks. Failed, to, it goes to zero. Works as expected, similar to Mario's all or nothing, but for the partner. And that is hex 0109. FP drain partner with the partner icon, here's what it looks like. Only takes one BP. Drops allies attack by one, but gains one FP per attack. Works as expected, similarly to Mario's FP drain, but for his partner. Item hex 012A. So I guess that would have been a good way to farm even more FP, so that probably went unused just because having both that on the partner and on Mario would have made running out of FP borderline impossible, depending on, you know, how often you use your main attacks. Alright, Flower, Happy Flower, P, which, in my opinion, I don't see why this went unused. This would have been just fine for the partner. I mean, Happy Heart was used for the partner, why not Happy Flower? I guess it's because both Mario and his partner share the same FP pools. If they had separate FP pools, that probably would have been used. Would have likely allowed Mario's partner to occasionally restore 1 FP. Most likely unused due to the fact that allies do not have separate pools of FP, just as I said. Alright, Lucky Day partner. It would have used 7 BP. Here's what it would have looked like. Alright, when an ally is attacked, makes foes miss more often. So, I want to say that might be a 20% chance to make them miss. But anyways, item hex 0130. Mega Jump, which was used in the first game, but wasn't used here, weirdly enough. Only Power Jump's used. Here's what it would have looked like. Only uses 3 BP. Allows Mario to perform a more powerful jump attack that costs 6 FP. Having 2 or more of these takes some more FP, but increases damage in return. Which you can do with other badges like Flyer Drive, like I did in the playthrough. 014C. Mega Quake! Which was another badge that was used in the first game, but not used here. 4 BP, here's what it would have looked like. Allows Mario to perform a more powerful hammer attack that costs 7 FP. Having more or having two or more of these takes up more FP, but increases Mario's damage in return. The item hex, 014E. Mega Smash used in the first game as well. Here's what it would have looked like. 1 BP for some reason instead of 3. Allows Mario to perform a more powerful hammer attack. 
at the cost of 6 FP. Having two or more of these takes some more FP, but increases damage in return. 014D, Pity Flower P. Here's what it would look like, would have taken up 3 BP. When Mario's ally is attacked, it will occasionally recover 1 FP. 0133, the item hex. I triple dip. Here's what it would have looked like, just like the double dip badge, only with a 3 on it instead of a 2. Would have taken up 6 BP. Osmar would use 3 items in one terms. Triple dip, get it? And these icons are shown in battle under the item menus of both trip double dipped badges are worn. The BP cost is the same as equipping two double dip badges, but equipping triple dip only enables triple dip. So I guess that's most likely why that went unused. It was just really redundant. Just use two triple dips. It's the same freaking thing. <laughs> and that suggests that it wouldn't have been able to stack with double dips. And double triple dip partner, no BP cost, so that likely got scrapped before they could put one in there. A BP cost would have likely allowed Mario's partner to use up to three items in one turn. Triple DP and his icons, and, and this icon, are shown in battle under the items menu. Both double dip P badges are worn. The BP cost is the same as equipping two double dip badges, but equipping triple DP only enables triple DP. No item hacks. Alright, invalid item. Here is what it looks like. It looks very similar to the Dodge badge, or the, the Dodge Master badge, if I think that's what it was called. And uh, it would have taken up 2 BP, and here's the partner version of it as well. Also, invalid name, too. Likely an early version of the Fend command that would have required a badge to use, which, glad they didn't do that. Imagine if that required a badge to use in the final game, which, funnily enough, the first game didn't have anything like that either. If you needed to just straight up defend. I like an early version of the defend command that the partner could use, or having a bad huge, which again, glad they didn't do. Being able to just naturally defend is a good thing, in my opinion. 014F is that item hex, and 0150 is that item hex. Supercharge, here's what that badge would have looked like. 2BP, and same with the partner version, also 2BP. A recolored version of the charge badge enables a supercharge option in the tactics menu, costing 2 FP to charge Mario's next attack by 2, making it a more expensive charge badge for no extra benefit. Yeah, because the original charge can only charge, can already charge by 2, but for 1 FP, so this probably got scrapped pretty early on, because now you're spending more just to do the same thing. This badge can be stacked with additional copies increasing the charge power by 2. Compared to a, a, additional charge badges, only increasing the charge power by one. And same with the partner. This is just for the partner. Debug badge. It's got the same design as the Zaptap badge, as you know, one of my favorite badges, if not my favorite badge, to use in both the original, the first game, and in Thousand Year Door. Alright, uses the Zaptap badge icon, would have taken up 1 FP. It makes Mario and his partner super guard every time an enemy attacks, and automatically activates all action commands and stylish moves. Except for the special moves, like the, the Crystal Star powers. It also makes the runaway meter full for Mario and partner. If Mario uses Power Bounce or Gumbel uses multi block, the attack will continue until being forcibly capped, since every enemy has their own little damage cap whenever you use those two attacks, no matter how well you do the action commands. Generally, 5 to 10 bounces for bosses, or 9,999 9 for normal enemies. I think I can tell why that badge got uh, scrapped, because that is fucking broken. Maybe it was just used as a way to test, like, enemy damage values or... Mario and partner's damage values, most likely, and, you know, if the devs needed to escape a battle they didn't want to run into, they could just instantly escape, so that... So, either this got scrapped because, one, this is broken as hell, or two, it was just used for testing purposes, most likely why it doesn't have its own badge icon, and doesn't even have a name, it's just called Debug Badge. Alright, lucky start P for the partner, but for some reason doesn't have the partner icon. Would have taken up 2 BP. Looks exactly like the Lucky Start badge, intending to be the Lucky Start P. As they, as one equipped it, it functions as Lucky Start for Mario's partner. Equipping both Lucky Start and his badge as has the strange effect of not always granting Mario's partner a status effect. Maybe evidence that Lucky Star was originally going to cost 2 BP instead of 4 BP in the final game. Also, most partner, most partner versions of badges have the same BP cost as Mario's badges, not less. Uh, unless it's the uh, stat boosting ones like the uh, the the power plus badge for partners, which cost six. Actually, that's no, the HP plus badges that cost six. Excuse me, misnomer. Anyways, the hex number for that one would have been zero fourteen B, and the hex number for the one we just read would have been zero fourteen A. And finally, just unknown. Here's what that icon would have looked like: hex column with a person in it. 
no BP cost, and possibly an early Ice Power Ice Smash match. Anyway, nothing. And it doesn't mention it here, but the Prince Much fight that we do see, and most likely the Wacka fight that we see in the remake, was also in use in the original GameCube release, which I'm glad they went back on that and brought that back in the remake. So it would have been cool fighting him in the original anyways. But... That's it with uh, the unused content for Paper Mario, the Thousand Year Door GameCube version. And there's no separate one for the Switch version, I looked that up. So that's why we only did the GameCube version. So if y'all enjoyed this and you want to see more, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, and follow. Hit one of the videos you see on the screen right now, and that bell button for more. And also answer the question today, of all the unused content we just went over, which one do you think should have been in the final game? And why? In my opinion, I think of all the unused content, not all this. The one that should have been used... Honestly, bring back the part, the other six partners that didn't make it, since, you know, Lady Bow and Paracarry only through a cameo, though, did make it back in the final version, as and, uh, cameos in again, because Lady Bow is special, she got her own little piece of dialogue, and uh, appearance in the postgame in Poshley Heights. So, that's in my opinion what I would have most likely loved to see, you know, actually make it into the final game, the other partners in their respective areas. But anyways, thank you all for watching, have a terrific day.